Okay, well, good evening, everyone. I think, uh, I think we should get started. I don't want to eat into Professor Martinek's time too much, and uh, I'd like to hear what he's got to say tonight. So um, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining us this evening. Um, it's, it's been a great conference so far. Um, very, very interesting papers. Um, I'd like to say, of course, a good afternoon, good morning, and even good evening to some people. I know we've got many different jurisdictions coming in uh, here, and uh, of course, good morning to Professor Martinek. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our colleague, Professor Martinek, who um, uh, many of you, of course, will already have heard of, uh, but I will give you a very brief introduction uh, from, uh, well, an outstanding biography uh, by any count. So, Professor Michael Martinek holds the Chair for Civil and Commercial Law, Business Organization Law, Comparative Law, and Private International Law of the University of Saarland in the Saarbrücken. Um, he is also Director of the Institute of European Law, uh, and his background in education is quite varied. He's uh, initially a specialist in ancient languages, um, there, um, he's also studied law and philosophy in Berlin, in London and Hamburg. Uh, practical experience as a lawyer as well. Uh, then a doctoral thesis in law uh, and one in political science as well. Uh, and as well as that, of course, a, a, a degree of Master of Comparative Jurisprudence by the New York University as well. So a very distinguished academic background. He then moved on to the professorial uh, qualification, the Venia Legendi, in 1986, uh, and then uh, moved to the University of Munster, uh, and then appointed Professor for Life at Saarland University in Saarbrücken. So a very, very distinguished academic background. His research fields, or his main research interests, are German and European commercial and business law, trade regulation law, and antitrust law, particularly the law of distribution systems and banking law. Um, he's a director of the Institute of European Law, as I've already said, and written a number of books uh, over, well, I think, 300 articles, and it came out to now. So many, many articles as well, and has been uh, given many um, visiting fellowships and honorary degrees as well from around the world, including Warwick University, uh, uh, Jungon University of Economics and Law in China, and um, the University of Lille, the University of uh, um, Romania, and the University of Warsaw in Poland as well, and also in South Africa. So very, very distinguished background, very well recognized in, uh, in academia for his academic uh, pursuits in the study of law. Uh, but also, of course, because of all this background, are very experienced in the teaching of law as well, and in the uh, theories to do with the teaching of law. And tonight, he's going to be talking about a theme uh, which is um, very well, central to the, uh, this particular conference. Uh, so uh, Professor Martinek will be talking about the future of legal education uh, from a civil law perspective. Uh, so please, everyone, uh, I look forward with all of you to listening to Professor Martinek, and I'll hand over to Professor Martinek now. Professor, I think you need to unmute yourself. I don't know if we've, if we've muted you or if you've got to unmute yourself. Now you should That's be able it. To We can me. hear you. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gallagher, for your flattering remarks. Are uh, indeed flattering, and I can only hope that I will live up with the expectations you may have raised. Um, you, live, you left out where Saarland is located. Probably not all of you are aware of that. It is one of the 16 member states of the Federal Republic of Germany, not too far away from Luxembourg, the border or to Luxembourg and um, very close to the French border indeed, and the very west, so to speak, of West Germany. Um, let me start off with compliments for the organization and administration of this wonderful conference. I can agree to what Professor Wolf said this morning in his introductory remarks, namely that this is in fact the uh, most astonishing and um, certainly the uh, biggest conference that I ever have participated. And um, I can only utter my deep respect um, and admiration for all these organizational and administrative um, efforts that you have um, 
uh, made so successfully. And it is, of course, an honor for me to uh, contribute here um, my thoughts as keynote speakers. I'm still very much under the impression of the previous contributions of Professor Neuwer, Professor Cavallaglio, and um, Williams. And um, I have already learned a lot. And perhaps you can also learn something of what I have to say about the future of legal education in a civil law perspective, which basically means a perspective of the continental European countries um, following the civil law system in the wake of the Roman law tradition, notwithstanding the Romanic or Germanic descent. The subtitle of my presentation has not been disclosed in the program. Um, it goes as follows, legal education between scholarship and pragmatism. Um, um, in a globalized world. The two poles scholarship and pragmatism denote in fact a classical dilemma of legal teaching. Should we educate more academic theoreticians, deep thinkers and problem solvers, or more professional legal service providers? In general, the law professors are more inclined to scholarship, of course, but the majority of the stakeholders in the universities, including the students, including the existing professionals and the politicians, have a tendency, of course, to emphasize more the importance of professional skills and practical lawyering. It is, after all, a market organization issue. The providers of legal education prefer scholarship the demanders want more pragmatism, preparation for the professional life as lawyers. Mm. Academia versus practice, or intellect versus business, to put it harshly. There is a widespread discontent in the law schools, and as they call themselves in the law faculties in continental European countries, about the legal education being partly outdated and overripe for shifts to modern directions. Globally speaking, the universities and law schools in civil law countries are lacking behind with regards to a modern legal education. They can and do learn a lot from common law countries, particularly the US and the UK. The main shortcomings and complaints are the students when leaving the university are too old and unfit for the entry into a legal profession and have no appropriate knowledge of the commercial and international dimensions of cross-border legal problems like private international law, comparative law, international commercial arbitration and so on. They do not know where today in a globalized world the real action is. The absolvents of for legal university education are encumbered, this is the main complaint, by useless details and academic theories. Of course, much of the criticism is an exaggeration. I think um, Professor Cavallaglio has rightfully pointed out the importance of culture and the legal culture. Mm, however, the main point is in fact accurate, and it comes as no surprise, therefore, that the legal education in practically all of the civil law countries is in a state of flux more than ever before. Let us have a closer look on the shifts from the traditional orientation to modern directions. What are the centers of gravity 
um, characterizing the transitional period we are in, which the legal education and civil law systems is presently subject to. I have, dear listeners, dear viewers, dear visitors, I identified several movements or shifts that are currently taking place and that you can encounter in the continental European law schools of the civil law system. Movements into modern directions. They overlap more or less in practice, but can be differentiated in our analytical view and for our analytical purposes here. I'm speaking of law schools, whereas the continental European uh, lawyers never would use the term law school to um, describe uh, what they call the law faculty and um, the faculties of law in the universities, because they still have this uh, academic approach that a university is something totally different from a school. Uh, nevertheless, for our purposes, it's perfectly all right to also speak of law schools. And I think the future will also shift into this direction. Now, the law students in civil Europe, in continental Europe and civil law countries were indeed traditionally educated as legal scholars solving problems of interpretation in their ivory tower. By contrast, in England, the legal education was conceived as a pragmatic training from the outset, already since the days of the Inns of Court, and let here, as in all the common law countries, basically, and as a matter of tendency, led to the educational ideal of the practicing lawyer in the sense of an advocate or a tour. In continental Europe, the education and ideal for the law students never was the practicing lawyer who identifies him or herself with the interests of a party and struggles for the best outcome of the case in favor of his or her party. The ideals on the continent were different, and still partly are different. In the Romanic countries, the ideal lawyer is not the impressive advocate whom we know from the American television series, pleading before the court like a showmaster sometimes, but it was traditionally the ideal administrator, the bureaucrat in his office, preparing a decision and looking at the superordinated interests of the state to find a just solution of a legal problem in an objective way in the interest of common good and the public welfare. This was decidedly the case in France, but also to a minor degree perhaps in countries like Italy, Spain or Portugal. And the young law students were, partly still are, educated in this spirit as servants of the political administrative system. In the Germanic countries of the civil law system, like Germany, Austria, Switzerland, partly perhaps Denmark or the Netherlands, but also countries like Greece, the ideal of the legal education was for two or three centuries the philosophical judge applying the law to resolve a controversy between the parties in accordance with the legal methodology aiming at justice. The, lung, the young law students were all educated as if they wanted to become a judge. In many of the continental countries, the traditional jurists were trained by a state organized, or at least state controlled legal education, basically for the judiciary and only partly for the advocacy. 
Only in the last two or three decades, a slow, indeed too slow, movement has commenced to also take into account that the majority of the law students ends up as practitioners, as practicing lawyers, be it in a law firm or be it in a um, company as corporate lawyer. We see presently a strong movement away from the old ideals of legal education, away from the ideal administrator in Romanic countries, away from the philosophical judge, and towards legal practice in the consulting or litigating advocacy. Thus, a shift is taking place, number one, from ivory tower scholarship to professional pragmatism. This means a reorientation regarding the content of the legal education, of course. Previously, comprehensive knowledge was required by the law students in their examinations, doctrines and theories in contract of property law, in state organization or administrative law, in criminal law, and in the different procedural laws mattered most. Learning by heart, masses of knowledge, was notorious for studying the law. Today, however, the emphasis, the emphasis lies more and more on versatile legal skills. This is exemplified by the growing importance of moot courts as part of the educational curricula, by oral exams replacing increasingly the traditional tests in writing. It is also exemplified by um, the growing number of adjunct professors, part-time professors recruited from the bar or from the judiciary or from administrative bodies teaching the students about their daily legal problems. Less philosophy and less theory, but more craftsmanship and technique is the motto. Soft skills in general become increasingly part and parcel of the modern legal education in civil law countries. Undoubtedly, a transition can be noticed from the old ideal of comprehensive knowledge of law to versatile legal skills, including, of course, rhetorical skills, which were neglected in the civil law tradition for such a long time. This is number two, a shift from knowledge to skills. The different branches of private and commercial law, as well as in criminal and public law, formally, um, the application in all these fields, formally the application and interpretation of legal provisions in the codes or contracts, in the regulations or directives, um, played an overwhelmingly important role. Students had to learn by heart what the courts say or what the professorial opinions were about. The exams were to find out if the student could apply and comprehend the law to old cases of the past. The types of interpretation, verbatim or grammatical interpretation, historical interpretation, systematical or context, contextual interpretation, or teleological interpretation, purpose-oriented, you know, were, so to speak, trained up and down and back and forth in the light of the pertinent judgments or professorial opinions. Professorial opinions were so important for the students because in many countries, decidedly so in Germany, in the, our legal system, um, uh, mattered really a lot. In fact, the um, Germanic system can be called basically a professorial law. It is the professors um, uh, who finally shape the law. Um, uh, hardly would a court dare 
to uh, derive to a conclusion without um, taking into account what the professors had said. Today, the genuine legal reasoning, the formulation and justification of the student's own opinion plays an ever increasing role and matters decidedly more. The application of law in the sense of subsuming a factual pattern under the norms of the existing positive law does not play the most important role anymore. The students are more and more confronted with the art of establishing a case convincingly themselves, no matter what the courts or the professors say. The major advantage is firstly, that the content of the legal studies moves away from a receptive, recapitulatory treatment of currently existing norms and previously decided cases, and it paves the way to deal with the law more freely and enable the students to deal better with future societal, commercial, or administrative problems um, when the law has changed probably and with future legal provisions which are presently still mm, unknown. Thus, number three, a transition can be noticed from application and interpretation as a hermeneutical, exegetical uh, art um, to skillful legal practical reasoning. In more and more countries of the civil law system, the university education departs also from the old claim that the lawyer should be a universalistically educated full jurist, having studied all important branches of his legal system. The trend in a growing number of countries is that the law students should only undergo a general legal education of perhaps two years and then specialize early in one of the main branches of law. The ideal of the unitary and universal full-fledged lawyer is increasingly being abandoned in favor of an early specialization. Indeed, the insight is growing that criminal law has little to do with the law of trademarks and patents, and that the problems of contract law have few connections to state organization law. Those are different worlds. In some countries, an early specialization in one of the, let's say, four main branches of law, or four types of lawyers, is under discussion. One, the private law centering contract property family inheritance law, two, commercial law including company law and competition law, three, public law with state organization, human rights, fundamental freedoms, and administrative law, and four, uh, probably criminal law. The branches of specialization can be called exemplary since they all leave room and opportunity for general issues of legal methodology and reasoning and in so far possess a common basis no doubt although they differ a lot because of the peculiarities and their respective contents and subjects. Thus, number four, a movement from encyclopedic universalism to exemplary specialization can be noticed. Closely connected with the aforementioned tendencies, one can also observe a partial departure from dealing mostly with tricky conceptual details in the course of one's legal studies. The law student was always notorious among his fellow students from other subject matters for his or her conceptualism and mathematically correct treatment of terms and concepts, notions and definitions and so on. This is replaced to some extent by the awareness of values 
and guiding principles. Let me give you an example. The bona fide acquisition of a movable thing from a non-proprietor who only pretends to be the owner is made possible by most of the civil law countries if the acquirer, buyer, trusts in the property of the alien or the seller because of his possession. The possession provides for a presumption of, for the presumption of property. This is the rule. Bona fide acquisition is permitted, although it causes an expropriation of the true former proprietor. The reason is protection of the trust of the acquirer and protection of smooth traffic in property. However, bona fide acquisition is barred in the majority of civil law countries and the movable thing has been stolen from the owner, the previous owner, so to speak, or when the owner lost his possession, his possession involuntarily. Here, the legislator considers the protection of the proprietor a higher value than the trust of the acquisitor um, acquirer in the property um, of the aliener possessing the thing without holding the property title. The reason for the rule is that the owner who lost the possession voluntarily is hereby enabled the possessing aliener to pretend his ownership and hereby to create trust of the acquirer. And the reason for the exception is that the owner who lost the possession involuntarily did not enable the possessing aliener to pretend his ownership and cannot be blamed therefore for having enabled the aliener to pretend ownership. Some countries like Italy or Russia do in fact not know this exception of, um, from the bona fide acquisition rule and permit also acquisition um, ac and the expropriation of the former owner when the thing has been stolen. You know what? Many students learn and know the pertinent provisions, can well and perfectly apply the rule and the exception to a case but have not the slightest idea about the value decisions behind them. Most students traditionally think in concepts, in definitions, in terms, and not in value decisions, in, re in legal reasons behind the norms. And it is most laudable that this is now changing rapidly and the change has already succeeded. We can observe number four, no, number five, in fact. We can observe number five, a shift from tricky conceptual details to value-oriented principles of the law education. Of far greater importance is certainly the widespread recognition among the stakeholders of the legal education that the former concentration on um, only the national legal system of just the own country must be replaced by a cross-border orientation and in fact an internationalization of the law studies. This means first of all intercultural competence. We speak here of legal culture of course. The modern lawyer is required to learn foreign language. We have already touched this subject. At least one in addition to, the nation, to his national or her national tongue. The legal education must acknowledge that in a globalized world, language skills are important also for lawyers, not only English, but also Spanish or Italian, and why not Chinese, with a focus on the legal terminology then. For the legal curricula, this means not only enhanced efforts for exchange programs with, between the universities, and perhaps um, a mandatory year abroad at a foreign law school, but also an internationalization 
of the law faculty in the sense of foreign professors from different countries. Visiting professorships, guest lectures are um, experiencing um, and in fact virtually boom um, right now. More and more faculties recruit professors from different countries. The Bologna reform process must be mentioned here. Initial, initiated already two decades ago, in fact, in 1999. It was an agreement between the ministers of education of the European countries and aims at a harmonization of the organizational structures of the different study programs at the universities of Europe, including the study courses of law. law. Although some countries still boycott this agreement with regards to legal education, the Bologna process has already led to a remarkable compatibility, interchangeability, and to a recognition of courses and study programs between the countries, which has remarkably enhanced the international mobility and flexibility among students, doctoral candidates, research fellows, and professors. Thus, number six, a shift from narrow-minded nationalism to inter intercultural competence can be observed in the legal education in more and more civil law countries. A corollary of the aforementioned tendency is the increasing importance of formerly neglected fields of law, like private international law, public international law, and first of all, comparatively. We find these branches of law more and more included in the curricula, and rightfully so. The developments point into the direction that a country's own contract law, property law, criminal law, administrative law, and so on, is being treated as just an example of how the law can deal with the pertinent challenges of societal, economic, or administrative issues of order and peace. The true and most valuable legal studies are comparative per se. This insight is gaining territory. The domestic law of one's own country is contingent. It could also be different. And this invokes an unbelievable enlightenment, enlightenment for the young lawyer and makes him or her think in societal, commercial, and administrative problems of order and peace. Thus, number seven, a shift from domestic legal studies to comparative problem resolutions can only be welcomed in the modernized legal education of civil law. Turning our, intention, uh, our attention to the instruments of legal teaching and learning, it is easily recognizable that the times of the law students spending endless hours in the law libraries to read and learn the law by bulky volumes of commentaries, treatises, collections of judgments, and so on, are over. The law students learn already as freshmen and sophomores, how to use the internet, particularly the legal databases, and how to make themselves mm, ready for um, the modern world, for the most part um, independent from books in finding an answer to a legal issue. Thus, number eight, a shift from elaborate treatises to efficient internet techniques is evident. Mm. The new emphasis on versatile legal skills, on legal reasoning, and on discursive discussions also pushes aside partly the classical great lecture of a professor for 100 or more students about introduction to contract law or principles of state organization law and the like. Instead, discursive workshops in small groups with interactive participation of the students are winning territory in more and more 
law schools. Thus, number nine, a shift from one-way lectures to discursive workshops is obvious in continental European law schools. Closely connected again with the movement just mentioned is the employment of new digitalized techniques um, in teaching and learning, replacing the partly outdated analog instruments. I'm talking here about online lectures via Zoom, or Microsoft, um, and so on, videos or other communication programs, making a personal presence at a certain place, at a certain time, um, redundant. Thus, number 10, a shift from analog to digitalized teaching and learning is conspicuous in the legal education of civil law countries. Last but not least, it must be mentioned that the modern lawyer cannot foster anymore the lone wolf attitude of a deep thinker in his um, or her studies at home um, or in the library, but must commit him or herself to a on team spirit, since the complexity and diversity of many legal issues simply demands today team working of different expert specialized lawyers. This one must learn and can learn already during the years of studying law. Thus number, I think 11, a shift from the lone wolf attitude to team spirit and team work has become an inexorable command, not only for the practicing lawyer and the visit in the world, uh, but also already for the law student at the university. Now, let me come to a conclusion. Um, please do not understand the message of my paper. I do not advocate, nor do I observe, a complete withdrawal of the old orientations of legal teaching and learning. There should and will be always room and opportunity for ivory tower scholarship of some students who do not want to familiarize themselves with professional pragmatism. It should and will be perfectly all right also in the future that some law students prefer and strive for a comprehensive legal knowledge instead of versatile legal skills. And it is even understandable and legitimate that some students and professors concentrate fully on domestic fields of law and shut themselves off to foreign languages and intercultural competence. Also the lone wolf in the coldness and solitude of um, the study at home will certainly remain to be an indispensable character in the university life among all the team spirit enthusiasts. The reality of the legal, of the legal education in the civil uh, law countries of continent Europe nevertheless is changing rapidly and it is moving into the directions which I have tried to uh, show. Um, and those directions are certainly also more advanced in, at least partly, in common law countries. And in so far, the common law countries may have, because of their tradition and their traditional emphasis on the practicing lawyer, they may have an actual lead and a competitive advantage. Professional pragmatism, legal reasoning, early specialization, efficient internet techniques, discursive workshops, digitalized teaching and learning, team spirit. Those are the new directions in the legal education. My legal message and the gist of my paper is, so to speak, a theory of convergence. I did not deal with the advantages of the traditional 
legal education in, come in civil law countries. And I did not touch the issue in how far also the common law jurisdictions and countries and their legal education can profit from our tradition. Um, that is certainly also to quite a big deal the case. But I do observe a convergence. We all know the theory of convergence between common law and civil law. And I think that also is um, true with regard to the legal education in common law and civil law systems. So the gist of my paper is that um, a convergence of legal education in common law and civil law systems can be recognized leading to a new educational ideal of the jurist as a cosmopolitan legal service provider and manager. And I do thank you Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear students, for your attention and would like to invite you for, to a discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Martinek. Uh, a very enjoyable. Um, and uh, people can chat their questions in using the chat function. And I think um, because of, we, we didn't want to unmute everyone because of the confusion, I think that all the voices would, would cause. So please, if you have any questions, you can chat them in to me. I've already got a qu couple of questions that have been raised anyway. Um, I just wanted to say that, of course, your, your, your comment about the lone wolf, um, I was quote hoping that our own Professor Wolf, the Dean, would come in on this one. But, uh, <laughs> I know he's a, he's a great believer in, uh, in, in teams anyway, so uh, I don't think he needs to comment too much. So am I, in fact. Yes. <laughs> But that's it. And of course, uh, you, you've dealt with, a, again, a number of issues that have already come up and I think we'll keep on coming back to. One of which, of course, which is really interesting, is also a consideration a little bit of legal history and particularly um, the history of legal education, which I've heard already referenced today in, in an earlier session. So your interesting point about the difference in the civil law tradition of legal education and the common law tradition of legal education, the reference that was given uh, to professors in the civil law jurisdiction and, and actually the citing of professorial works. Whereas in the common law uh, tradition in England, I believe it was only at the beginning of the 20th century that, uh, that a professor's works would be cited unless they, they were dead. I think they, they didn't cite any living professors at the time. I think Sir Frederick yeah. Pollock was the first um, uh, legal academic really to be cited during his own lifetime. So, uh, and actually thinking of recent decisions in some of the areas, the property areas that I deal with, perhaps it would have been better not to cite uh, living professors. Maybe that's something we could talk about later. But let, me, let me read you some of the questions. So, um, first, is the move from the traditional legal education system to a skills-based training system not fatal? Without sound theoretical foundations, law students will become legal machines. Is this desirable? In light of the transition to a more skills-based legal education, should law be taught at universities at all? Would it not be better to leave such kind of mechanical training with professional training providers? Lots of questions in there for you. <laughs> yeah, that is of course um, a very serious point. And I'm fully aware that also some values of the old um, legal uh, European tradition um, will suffer from this movement. Um, and um, in so far, I mm, feel also a little bit sorry about this movement, no doubt. Um, Professor Gallagher has um, um, read my um, biography. <laughs> and therefore, you can easily imagine that I am a strong believer in what we call the humanistic education. And I think that it would, in many respects, ideal um, to um, pave the way for um, a greater acceptance and, um, uh, in fact, implementation in our university life, not, also in, not only in the legal studies, but also in many other fields, whereas we observe a clear tendency towards um, pragmatism and professionalism. 
nevertheless, uh, my reaction to this danger and my answer to the question is that there should also and always be left room enough for such tendencies and for this um, uh, humanistic values for a number of students that are willing, able, and ready to do so. Not so many are, and not so many even have the ability to follow these ideals. You know, our students come to the university without the slightest knowledge of Latin. How can you deal with the history of law and with the tradition of legal issues over the centuries without Latin uh, knowledge of Latin? In so far, we simply cannot close our eyes um, before the um, uh, truth that uh, the legal um, world, in fact, um, asks for professionally trained lawyers in the first place. And in so far, the shift is easily understandable. This is the number one concern to have professionally trained, pragmatic problem solvers, omnipotent problem solvers in our changing globalized world. And there is only, one can say, a reservation, a reservate, in fact, for uh, the old tradition of the uh, uh, literally and um, uh, philosophically um, ambitious um, type of scientific lawyer. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, one of the big questions I think I've, I've realized when I first started to teach law was that maybe it's a, a difference that came through in, in England when I was starting to teach law at a university that was a former uh, polytechnic, that there was this sort of split between an aspiration to train students for law and and also aspirations to be more of a, an academic institution as well. Um, there were many different factors that pushed into that. Uh, the, the next question is, assuming that the traditional all-round lawyer is a better, well-rounded lawyer, will the trend towards specialization, which Professor Martinek has described, lower the quality of law graduates? It depends on the uh, question, what do you call quality of a lawyer? Um, and which ideal you in fact um, pursue in the legal education. From the traditional point of view, we simply are confronted with a certain deterioration. Some of my el elder colleagues um, are really horrified by the change of the academic level of the students already when they come from their um, high schools and enter the university, but also when they finally pass the examination at the um, university as, and being lawyers sent out into the world. And in fact, compared to previous um, ages, one can say there is a not perhaps only deterioration, but a devastation of um, uh, old intellectual um, knowledge and um, understanding of the law. But on the other hand, look what the young lawyers have um, uh, accumulated uh, with regard to new abilities, internet techniques and so on, and solving legal problems today requires these new techniques to quite a higher um, degree than previously. The philosopher as such cannot um, be regarded as the better uh, lawyer uh, with regard to the skillful, trained professionalist in the law. And in so far, um, I can only plead for an um, understanding of these shifts and for the needs of the practice, we must first of all serve the needs of the markets and of what the world um, requires from the law schools. And in so far, um, we can only partly compromise. Thank you. It's sort of following on from that, and again, the, the things that you said, we, 
we actually expect quite a lot of our law graduates when they go into legal practice now. As you said, we expect this, this technical ability, the knowledge of all the new technology, mm -hmm. but also we expect these skills and the, the, the interpersonal skills that, that are so stressed. And uh, my colleague, Professor Michael Lauer, has sort of addressed this. He's asking a question here saying, you know, today people are more technically accomplished, but is that at the expense of some of the solidarity uh, and an ability to empathize that perhaps came from a more humanistic education, a, more, a wider education, we thought? Mm. I'm not sure that this is the case. Um, I mean, um, I certainly uh, put a lot of value on technical skills, but I also put a lot of val uh, um, value on the understanding of principles and on the legal reasoning and on the value system behind the normative system. And I think um, in so far um, the um, uh, university education in the law faculties or law schools um, can never be one-sided and only look at the practical needs of uh, uh, professions, particularly the practicing lawyers. We still need a solid foundation um, with regard to the intellectual basis and the cultural backgrounds, also no doubt the history of the law. Um, uh, Professor Lauer addressed uh, the issue of the history. Let me just shortly come back to that. You know, I still believe that um, also history and the history of law serves a lot for our modern purposes. After all, history is a kind of comparison. It is a kind of comparative law because you constantly compare the present current legal situation which, with, with what was formerly the case. Hereby you can learn a lot to the same degree perhaps as if you look cross border to present to, to currently existing different legal systems. Uh, in fact, some of the theorists uh, differentiate between horizontal comparatism you know, comparing current existing law in different states and vertical comparative law, which is in fact history of law. And so far, I definitely include uh, the idea of uh, deep studies of history of law as a source of enlightenment um, for the value systems and for um, the uh, differences of the changing legal worlds and for different solutions in different societal contexts. Um, and um, uh, this does not um, in so far um, uh, can be abolished. It can certainly not be abolished. It is necessary and it is um, uh, no doubt a second column at least with regard to the first column, skills of professional pragmatism. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for your talk. I think we've just about run out of time. Uh, so I'd like to, to thank you again and say, wonderful talk, really interesting. The history thing was something we could have developed because of course we're, 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 we're very interested in the, the legal history side in, in, in the CUHK law, but a very successful legal history seminar series. So it's something that, that surprised us initially. We, we hadn't realized how much practitioners are actually interested in legal history. And I think many reasons that you say would come into why it's been so successful. So thank you very much for your talk again.